Amen. If you have your Bibles, would you open up to Luke chapter 24? I know the screen is going to say John. We're in our John series, right? But I wanted to pause for a moment and tell you a story from Luke's gospel that occurs like, like literally right after the resurrection, like on the day of the resurrection, moments after the resurrection. I feel like it's going to be a bit of a description of our cultural moment right now, so it's super important. So though the screen says, John, we're turning to what gospel? Very good. See, you're awake. In 1946, author and Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl, you may remember his name, he wrote a book entitled Man's Search for Meaning. In it, he chronicles the experiences He had as a prisoner of war in a Nazi concentration camp during World War II. As a doctor, he cataloged, he inventoried all of his observations that among fellow inmates in the camps, those who survived were the ones who were able to connect with a purpose, a purpose for their lives. And in so doing, they were able to find meaning for their lives that they felt positive about. That's where the name of the book comes from. They then immersed themselves in imagining that purpose to what they were doing. He discovered that the way a person imagined the future directly affected his longevity. If he could attach meaning or purpose, he or she would have a better chance at survival. To say it another way, it wasn't the strongest, not the most intellectual who tended to survive. It was the ones who who could provide meaning for their meaninglessness or or at least hopelessness in that sort of dark setting. If they could find meaning in their suffering, meaning in their despair, meaning in even the bleakest of settings, I can't imagine a bleaker setting than a concentration camp. They could survive or they'd be more fitted for survival. It's an interesting idea. Last weekend, we studied the events of Easter, a time that at the time, was sort of surrounded by significant darkness. I think we underestimate that now because we know how the story ends. We know that in chapter 20 of John, Jesus comes back to life, and we can forget that the disciples had to actually live chapters 18 and 19. They didn't know Sunday was coming. When he was crucified on Friday, they had to walk out Saturday. We know how the story ends, and we can fast forward through the dark tragedy of it. We can fast forward through the mystery of it. We can fast forward through the discouragement or the disappointment or the hardship of it, right? Remember those events on the calendar, though? The soul-crushing agony of Gethsemane, the place where Jesus would bear his soul, his heart to God, telling God how much he didn't want to go through what he's about to have to go through with. The betrayals, not one, but two of them, the arrest, the mock trial, the torture, the execution, how shrouded in darkness this good story is. We know the happy ending, but they did not. They had to live it. It was a time that looked as if darkness had won, that death had the final word. And that's where we pick up the story this morning. There's two travelers who are walking away from all this. Oh, Jesus has been the talk of Jerusalem. Jesus is the talk of the town. And not just his death anymore. Oh, that was a big deal too. But now there's begun to be rumors spreading around, gossip. Did he rise From the grave, some ladies say that they saw an empty tomb, but they're ladies, right? Their opinion doesn't count. That's not me talking. That's the first century. (laughs) Save your texts and emails. If you send one, I'm jay at (laughs) midtownvineyardchurch.com. There's rumors spreading around. One lady says she actually saw him. And there's two figures, two people, two travelers trying to understand all of this. That's where we're dropping in today. So Luke chapter 24, verse 13 says, now that same day, two of them uh, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. That same day is Easter Sunday, what we celebrated last week. Two of them refers to two disciples of Jesus, one of whom remains unnamed. We'll find out in a moment that one of them is named Cleopas, but the other one isn't given a name in the story. One commentator writes that Luke almost certainly obtained this information from one of these two disciples. He went and found them and wrote down their eyewitness account for us. The details are just too personal to not be the case, right? And as he writes this down, what Luke does is he doesn't name one of them. Why? Because you're reading not just history, 
you're reading literature too. Like this actually happened. But when Luke wrote this, he wanted to do it in such a way where he would exaggerate, well, emphasize certain portions of it, put accents on certain portions of it so that you would read yourself into the story. He left off the name of one of them purposefully so that you will insert yourself there. So that same day, two of them were traveling to a village called Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. They're leaving Jerusalem where everything has happened. It's the arrest, the trial, the execution, the rumors of the resurrection, uh, where one of the characters will attest in just a moment that he saw uh, something happen on that Good Friday. But they're walking away from the epicenter of all this. They're walking it out. They're going back where they came from, walking away from the moment of explosion. They've been They've been thinking about all of this, right? This is symbolic. They're walking away. Verse 14, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. So as they walked together, probably returning from Passover celebration, it gave them opportunity to talk. As they talked, they spoke of the things that were on their hearts, trying to make sense of what they had just seen, what they had just experienced, the things that happened around the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus. As they talked, verse 15, and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. Pause. What? And then continues, because this is so Jesus. But they were kept from recognizing him. I mean, that can you imagine? Right? It's such a great story to see in your mind's eye. These two people are walking away from Jerusalem, the epicenter, the locus point, right? They're going to Emmaus, and the risen Jesus, who they are talking about, trying to make sense of what's going on, he joins their journey. And look what he says. This is so Jesus. Verse 17, what are you guys discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. So notice the drama here. Right? There's a tension that's building. The language of this seems to indicate that as Jesus is walking, he's kind of, he's walking near their walking, right? And, and he begins to listen in, and they probably see him in the first century, and still today in the East, hospitality is a big deal. So they probably allow him into the conversation, and it seems clear from their body language, the level of language here, that their, their faces are downcast. They're discouraged. They're defeated. Their countenances suggested it, and he could tell. He picks up on it. What are you guys discussing as you walk along? One of them, verse 18, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? You see the irony? (laughs) This is Jesus. Only Cleopas doesn't know it yet. And so he says to him, are you the only one? Which is ironic because he's the only one who actually knows what happened there that day. It's so funny. The events surrounding Jesus must have been the talk of the town too. Because you see here in this story, these men are, it's all they could talk about. As they walk out of Jerusalem, right? And they are so appalled that there could be anybody who hasn't heard news of what happened there, which just seems to suggest, again, the history of this, right? We are not reading fairy tale. We're not reading myth. We're not reading some story that somebody made up. When Luke writes this and includes Cleopas' name and sends this out into publication, right, that first century world, he's basically inviting everybody to go find a dude named Cleopas who lives in Emmaus. Go talk to him. You could ask him yourself. This actually happened. This is history. A fairy tale wouldn't be written like this. Neither would an invented story. So Jesus says to them, uh, what are you guys talking about? And they go, the stuff that happened in Jerusalem. And he goes, what stuff? (laughs) And they go, are you the only person who hasn't heard what happened in Jerusalem? And verse 19, what things? Really, I mean, it's so brilliant. He's playing along with their conversation, encouraging them to open and reveal their hearts. Right? He knows what's in there, but he wants them to say it. He's not going to force himself on them. So he's, he's drawing it out of them. Isn't this beautiful? He wants to hear out loud the things that are kept inside. It's such a Jesus thing to do. Verse 19, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet. He was powerful in word, 
powerful indeed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. So these travelers, they don't know everything about Jesus. They're trying to make sense of it. Right? They're a bit stunned by whatever they saw back in Jerusalem. But they do tell this traveler, Jesus, what they do know about Jesus. They knew his name. Right? They know where he's from. They know that he's a prophet. They know that he's mighty in deed and word. I mean, he's performed miracles. Nobody can deny it. It's what got him in so much trouble. They knew he was crucified. They knew or, or the next verse seems to indicate they believed that he was sent to redeem Israel. And they knew, too, that people had said that he rose from the dead. They cite all that they do know. Verse 21, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. So they had hoped. You notice that. The past tense, circle, underline, highlight. They had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. They had hoped that he was the prophesied rescuer, the Messiah. But this is past tense. Their hope is in the rear view. They had hoped this, but now their body language seems to make more sense. This is why they're downcast. This is why they're dejected. This is why they're discouraged. This is why they feel defeated, because they had hoped, but their hopes were dashed, and now they're downcast. And isn't that where a lot of us live? We had hoped. I don't know, I mean, you fill in the blank. Like, we had a vision of what we thought life would be like. We had an idea of where we thought the Lord was heading or bringing us. These disciples had hoped, but now what they have is a hope disappointed. They had an idea of what God would do. They had an idea of what the rescuer would be like, how he would rescue Israel. And this rescuer named Jesus of Nazareth, who they're still on the fence about, they're not real sure, but either way, from their vantage point, he hadn't lived up to their expectations. Verse 22, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. This is so interesting, right? They, they say the, the only things that they have to go on are the testimony of other people. And namely, in verse 22, he says, our women amazed us. Which, pause there for a moment. As I said just a moment ago, the, the testimony of females in first century courtrooms wasn't considered as strong as men's. Right? So you can see a bit of this doubt. In Cleopas, when he's like, like, we think he, I mean, there's rumors, but all we have to base those rumors on is the testimony of ladies, right? That's what he's saying here. It's so interesting, too, because I think this kind of, in a reverse sort of way, testifies to the fact of the resurrection. Like, if you were going to make this story up, right, you wouldn't write it this way. You wouldn't have a a resurrected Messiah, go show himself to women first. If their testimony isn't as strong as men's in court, I'm not saying that should be the case. I'm just saying, if I was making it up, I would have a resurrected Messiah go show himself to men whose testimonies can be tried. The fact that he elevates the role of women in one move, and then in the next, appears to them first, it has to be true. No one would make this up. It's amazing. This, one, once they, the women see the empty tomb, is what they're saying here, right? These travelers, they run back to the disciples. And remember, this is what we studied last week. Then from there, Peter and John split. They go for the empty tomb. And John says three times that he's the one Jesus loves and two times that he beat Peter to the tomb. I don't know if you caught that. Like he really wanted to make sure he's the favorite and he was the first. Right? As they go on to cite the testimony of Peter and John. And then they even, they, they say that, well, they saw the empty tomb. They didn't see him. They saw the clothes, just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. It says, if Jesus is drawing this out of them, and Luke is writing it down to ask you, reader, 
nameless reader reading yourself into the story, can you believe without seeing? Verse 25. He said to them, and I love this, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. The actual phrase there, slow to believe, circle, underline, highlight, a bit truer to the Greek is slow of heart to believe. So what Jesus is saying here to these, to these travelers and maybe to us today is we often think that it's the head that stands in the way of belief, right? We think it's the facts. If we could understand Genesis, if we could understand science, if we could under like all these things that people cite as their reasons for not believing in Jesus, Jesus goes, it ain't a head problem. It's a heart problem. Like, that's where it actually is. The main obstacle to faith is not in the head, it's in the heart. Verse 26, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, I love this, he explained to them what was said in all scripture concerning himself. Now, this is a podcast I'd download. Jesus teaching the Bible and how it all is pointing to him, which is what it is, by the way. Right? I think so often it's, it's lost. It's a big book, and it's really intimidating. And when you hand somebody a Bible and go, you know, good luck, it's like, I don't know, I feel like I'm handing them a dictionary or the yellow pages. Like, you know, start at page one. Like, it'll be fun. You know, we don't understand it as a story, but that's what it is, and that's what Jesus indicates right here. The Bible, as big a book as it is, is really only three acts long telling one story. Act one, God creates. Somewhere back at the beginning, there's an uncreated creator who speaks the world into existence. Galaxies and stars and plants and animals. And the highlight of his creation, the crescendo at the end, the exclamation point, are human beings that he designed to live in relationship with him. But we don't get to have that. Why? Because of what happened in act two. Sin enters the picture. Sin causes a train wreck, and it disconnects us from our creator. But God predicts even there in Act 2, Genesis 3, verse 15, I'm going to send someone who's going to fix the train wreck. As early as Genesis 3, verse 15, he says, I'm going to send a rescuer who's going to fix the train wreck. And the rest of the Bible is everything God did to get to the person of Jesus. That's it. All the prophets... All the history, all the Psalms, all the stuff, all the pages of this book are pointing to Jesus. And you get to the end of Malachi and it closes and then you cross pages into Matthew chapter 1 and hear a faint cry from a Bethlehem manger when Jesus is born. <laughs> he goes, it's all about me, only they don't know it's him. It's a great trick. Right? So, Verse 26, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, I love this phrase. It's been stuck in my head all week. Jesus acted as if he were going further. Isn't Jesus always going further? Isn't he always calling us further? deeper, like there's no arrival, no debt. We just keep walking. With, he's always going further, and he gets there first and calls us to where he is as we walk with him. I just think there's such profound meaning there. He acted as if he were going further. He was going to part company with them. Verse 29, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. I love the phrase there, urged him strongly. You can circle, underline, highlight that. Some translations say they constrained him, right? It's a bit of a, I don't know, an aggressive, like you can't leave, right? They begged him not to go. Charles Spurgeon writes, they not only invited him, but they held him. They grasped at his hand. They tugged at his skirt. They said he should not go, have you ever felt that way about someone leaving before? They didn't know this was Jesus yet. They just knew they didn't want him to leave, whoever he was. And there's, that, there's that feeling that we sometimes get, a peace that comes to you in the middle of the night, a soothing calm in the midst of trial, some presence that moves in and you don't want it to leave. 
these people were experiencing something supernatural, and they cling. They go, please don't go. Verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it. Does this sound familiar? And began to give it to them. There are strong allusions here to what he did Thursday night before this. The Lord's Supper that he instituted for us that we'll celebrate next week. He's breaking bread, giving wine. Like This is such a strong allusion to what Luke has described just a few nights prior. 31, then their eyes were open. They're like, oh, it's Jesus, the person we, you should have said something. We were talking about you the whole time. You know, like they're, they're blown away. Their eyes were open and they recognized him. And right then, he disappeared from their sight. Classic Jesus, right? He's just gone. Like, there he goes. So, Jesus. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Even when they didn't know it was him, even when they didn't necessarily believe that this Jesus of Nazareth had risen from the dead, their hearts were burning because of the ministry of God's word and Jesus, the living word, teaching it to them. God's word can have the same effect on our hearts. Jesus' presence can have the same effect on our hearts. Did you know that? Like, we have access to his presence. The scriptures teach that after he bought our salvation and ascended into heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit. And we have access to that. And sometimes you can feel. Neither of them knew that the other one's heart was burning until Jesus left. And then they turned to each other and they're like, yours too? Yours too? It's an experience. Something happens. Jesus has an effect, a real effect upon our hearts. Verse 33, then they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two had, then the Two told what had happened on the way and how, sorry, my eyes are breaking, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. So we have two people, travelers, moving away from Jerusalem. This is symbolic, right? One is unnamed. That's you in the story. And they're moving away from Jerusalem. This is history and literature. It actually happened, and Luke is writing it in such a way that you'll see certain things in the story. There's symbols there. They're moving away from the home base of God, the locus point where God resides, where his activity in the Jewish mind and worldview is most visible. They're moving away from God into the unknown. They're going out and they're filled with questions, questions that have arisen in their own lives because of their severe disappointment, disruption. They had certain expectations of what God would do, Ways that he would be real in their lives. They're the rescue of his people through the Messiah. And these expectations were a little bit off, a little bit misguided, and thus unmet, and their hopes were dashed. And this is where so many of us live. Sometimes in our journeys here, walking with God, we experience great disappointment, some great disturbance. Maybe as we go through life, as we journey, we have an expectation about where it's going, how our life is going to turn out. We think that it's all going to be an upward trajectory. We think that our meaning or destination or purpose is going to be grand, and we live with that confidence, and then something happens along the way that seems to disrupt all of that, and suddenly our entire lives feel uprooted. We're confused, despondent, heartbroken, lost. Sometimes we walk away from God. We move away from Jerusalem. We walk away from our purpose or our meaning. Our hope is broken and dashed. We're confused, so we wander like these travelers, aimless and dazed. What just happened? Notice they're walking away from the place that represents God, but they're still talking about God. I think this can even happen among us. Right? I mean, here we are today. We're open to God. We're at church, but still, sometimes, isn't it true? Like, we, we are moving, though, with discipline. We're talking about God. They're talking about Jesus. Right? So the understanding that they're somehow, like, lost people, well, no, I don't, I don't get that impression at all. They were followers. They were just disappointed ones. Disruption will do this to you. 
a death that you didn't see coming, a divorce, a wound, job loss, being passed over for something. This wasn't what I expected. And so we begin moving away because we're so disappointed. Our cultural moment is one of disappointment. Study after study is showing this to be true. We think that what we want is just a couple steps ahead of us, and it's always just a couple steps ahead of us, no matter what it is. We think that what we want is just off in the distance, and once we get there, we find that it doesn't deliver to us what we thought it would, or it moves, or it gets disrupted altogether, and we stop the journey there. Disruption removes the possibility altogether, and so we wander aimless and lost, adrift, confused, talking to someone about the God that we've slowly begun to stumble away from. And then in walks Jesus. Notice, when Jesus meets up with them without them knowing that it's him, he's inviting them to embrace him. Not his stuff, not an expectation, not a plan, not, I mean, he's basically inviting them to trust him. And he, and he doesn't push himself on them, right? He gently walks up and waits for the invitation. When they arrive at their destination, he acts as if he's going to keep going until they have to invite him to stay. He waits for the, enter, the, the invitation because he's gentle and he won't force himself upon us. And once given the opportunity, as they as they walk, he begins teaching from scriptures about himself. You caught that, right? He's teaching about himself, not a plan, not a desired goal, not an outcome. He invites them to embrace him. I think sometimes what we think we want in life's darkest moments is answers. Right? Notice he doesn't give them a bunch of answers. I mean, he does. He answers them, but the answers are all about him. I think when we go through tragedy, when we go through disruption, when we go through disappointment, we think if we just had all the answers... If it all just made sense, I have so many questions. How could this happen? If I knew why, maybe it would hurt less. And I don't know why we think that. I don't see that. I've never experienced it. Remember, Jesus in John chapter 5, he's having this famous showdown with the Pharisees, a group of people whose job it was to search the scriptures and have answers. And you remember what he says to them? He goes, you guys are all into studying the Bible for, your, for answers, and that's great. You can study, you'll find some in there. There's some in there. But what you really will find in there, if you look closely, is the scriptures testify about me, and I'm what you really need. I know answers are what you think you want. I'm what you need. I think in this story, as he walks with these reeling travelers whose worldviews have been disrupted, he does take time to unpack for them answers, answers from Scripture. But those answers all point to him, and he is what they really need. Our desire for answers in dark moments of despair and disappointment makes sense to us. It's what we really want, but Jesus is what we need. And he invites these travelers, he invites us to himself. Makes the, the answers we think we need a bit of a red herring. When Jesus is what we need. And isn't this why, in retrospect, they noticed that when they were with him, their hearts were burning? Oh, those answers didn't do that. He did. He was providing them mean, a framework for their questions. Yes, there's answers in there, but that framework is built around him. And that's what they actually need. It's centered upon him. Jesus' invitation to them and to us is to trust this unanticipated Messiah. The one that from their perspective let them down. He's inviting them to follow him. The surprise purpose of God to them. To walk with him. To dine with him. To commune with him. And thereby to have their eyes opened and their hearts burning. We are people who are hardwired for meaning. We're programmed as human beings to make order where there doesn't appear to be any. And as Viktor Frankl shows, we can suffer. And as long as we can find meaning in that suffer, we can persevere. What Jesus gives these travelers is meaning, or more specifically, I would argue, hope. Hope. And isn't, isn't hope different than expectations? I was thinking about that this morning. Expectations get attached to things. Hope 
gets attached to a person. Expectations are specific. They have names and definitions. There's precision and descriptions. And as followers of Jesus, though, we're invited to hope. And that hope is to a person. It's different. It rises above circumstances. It floats and hovers over those circumstances. It's not tied to what we may have to endure down here. It's tied to a person who will give us the strength to endure. If you search the scriptures looking for answers, you may find some there. If you diagnose your circumstances looking for explanations, you may come up with a few. But if you meet Jesus on your Emmaus road, if you invite him into your journey, if you invite him into your meal, you may find your heart burning within you as he invites you to hope in him. And this is the journey that he invites all of us to take. The scriptures teach us to hope. Did you know that? All throughout the letters of the New Testament, all these guys are going, our hope, 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 hope. They're telling us constantly to hope. And I've realized recently, it's like, I'm a terrible hoper. I mean, I set my expectations low. That way I can't be disappointed. And it works real well for me when others set their expectations low too. Because then I can, it's like, oh, that's not a high bar to clear. I'm not a good hoper. Right? This isn't about managing our expect. This is about just hoping. And hope is connected to a person that no matter what goes on, Jesus, I'm walking with you. I'm not walking away from Jerusalem. The story ends with these two travelers who've been discouraged and defeated and they're moving away from Jerusalem. And when they, when they experience Jesus, you know what happens? They go back to Jerusalem. They go back to hope. They go back to meaning. It occurs to me today that might be where some of us find ourselves. Disappointed, discouraged, moving away from Jerusalem. And it occurs to me too that like what we said earlier, he is in this room right now. He gets back to heaven, but he sends the Holy Spirit and we have access to that spirit now. And if I'm reading the story correctly, it's just that touch from Jesus that changes everything and sends these guys back to Jerusalem. So it's almost as if we should just stop what we're doing now and meet with Jesus. Would you agree? Hmm. So, you do that with me? That's our ministry time here today. There's a Jesus who's coming alongside us on our journey, who's waiting to be invited in. And that's our invitation, to sit a minute and to meet with Jesus. So Ashton's going to play in a moment quietly. And I realize there's not a lot of places to be quiet anymore. I could be wrong about this, but I think my generation of church made it seem like in order to connect with God, it had to be loud and bright. And I loved it when I was a kid. The older I've gotten, the more I've come to appreciate the quiet. That still small voice. I'm not saying he's not in the loud and bright. But as everything around us has become so loud, and so bright. Sometimes it's easier to dial it back to hear him. One of my heroes is a musician named Rich Mullins who passed away in the late 90s. And he would tell this story about being at these concerts where they do worship and it's just loud and people are singing. It's very moving. And people would come up to him after the show and they'd be like, oh, that was such a great concert. The spirit was so active. And he would always want to say the same thing, which, really? Really? It was so loud in there. How could you tell? And I didn't quite get what he meant then, but I think I get it more now. Sometimes centering ourselves, right? Getting quiet, getting still. There's so few places to do that anymore. So I'm going to invite you to close your eyes to bow your heads. 
to invite Jesus into your journey. Wherever you are on it, if you find yourself moving away from Jerusalem to Emmaus, I bet you if you look around, you'll see him waiting to be invited into that conversation. If you find yourself at Emmaus at a table, he could push his way in, but he's probably not going to. You may need to ask him. So in the quietness of this place, Ashton's going to play for about one minute. One minute. It's so funny how uncomfortable one minute is when you're so used to noise. And as you meet with the Lord, you may just pray from where you are. Right there at your seat. You may get a group of you together to pray together over something. All sorts of ways to respond. Some folks find movement helpful. That's why these kneelers are up here. There's nothing extra sacred about them. It just might help you to connect with Jesus in a new way by coming up here. Same with these prayer candles. There's communion to my left, which he celebrated with these guys at the table. There's a prayer wall to my right at the back of the room. Wherever you are on the journey, take a moment to connect. It could change everything. After a minute, if you're new with us, just to explain what's about to happen, Ashton will begin singing. We will join her in that song. We'll stand and sing together. Then she'll pray over you. At her amen, you are free to go. We've enjoyed worshiping with you. We hope to see you back. If you're still in a moment of posture, quietness before the Lord, you take that moment because it's so important. There's no rush. You stay where you are. Jesus, What a miracle we have access to you. If we just open our eyes, or maybe if you would open them. So we invite you into this room. We invite you into our journeys. We invite you to this table. Would you meet us wherever we are, minister to us in this quiet place so we can head back to Jerusalem.